Mighty God. Lord, we pray for many things. We pray for many people. Father, you know those situations, you know those conditions, you know those scenarios better than we ever could, and we ask that those be resolved, be fulfilled, be healed, Father. Whatever their need, Father, we ask that you give it to them. But Father, now we ask for the need of us all to have a country more closer in keeping with your will. Father, we pray for leadership of a godly nature. We pray for more spirituality, not less. We pray for more ethics and morality, not less. We pray for insight. We pray for understanding. We pray for leaders who have them. Father, be with us. Help us to vote not our party, not our opinions, not our desires. Help us to vote our faith. Bless us always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. What do you pray for when you're by yourself? Um, I, uh, I'll be honest with you. My prayers fluctuate um, in their seriousness. Um, if I'm going through a health concern or I have someone who's close to me going through a health concern, I pray for that. Um, if I'm hoping for something to come through, wishing for something to come through that I, I think I need, or a situation that I want to work out, I pray for that. I pray very seriously for those things. If I'm watching the Tigers play, I pray for that. <laughs> like Doug was doing, please. It's been 108 years, please. Um, but I mean, if, it, that, if that whole thing proves anything, is that prayers work, right? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> We might all pray for different things. Prayer is a funny thing because prayer is misunderstood. Prayer is misunderstood deeply. Um, we often look at prayer as, as a, we've said this before, but we often look at prayer as wish fulfillment, right? As, as something that we do in order to, uh, to get something we want. And I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with, with, with people who, supposed atheists who say that one of the reasons why they don't believe in God is because they prayed for something and they didn't get it. That's not how prayer works, folks. That's not how prayer works. We don't pray to God and God, you know, it, it, prayer isn't casting a spell or if we say it in just the right way and ju with just the right tenor to our voice and just the right intention of our heart that God will be required by law to give us what we ask for. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is communication. Look, anybody, <laughs> anybody that's been married for longer than, I don't know, 15 minutes knows that just because you ask your wife for something doesn't mean she'll give it to you, right? Just because you ask your husband for something doesn't mean they'll give it to you. Marriage is not about wish fulfillment. It's about communication. And marriage with God is not about wish fulfillment. It's about communication. Because God, though he will occasionally give us what we want, if it doesn't pose a detriment to us, more often than he gives us what we want, he gives us what we need. He gives us what we need. And sometimes... Those needs, when they're fulfilled, that process is fruitful. It's enjoyable. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it's difficult. Because we want things a little too easy sometimes, don't we? We want things to be easy all the time. When the truth is, is that uh, we probably don't need more easy. We probably need more hard. Prayer is a funny thing. So I find it especially interesting when we read Paul praying. You see, Paul is unique in his writing in that he records on several occasions, in several different letters, he, rec he records his own prayer. Oh sure, there are other prayers recorded in Scripture. You have the prayer of, uh, of Deborah and Barak recorded in the book of Judges. Um, you have the prayer of, of Hannah recorded in 1 Samuel, thanking God for um, blessing her with uh, her child Samuel after her barrenness. You have the Magnificent in Luke, which is Mary's prayer of thanksgiving after you know she discovers that she's with child, after she meets with Elizabeth, her cousin. 
we have multiple prayers. And of course, the fam most famous prayer we have recorded is the Lord's Prayer. But what's interesting is, is that those are, those are third parties recording other people's prayers. Whereas Paul records his own prayers, his own personal prayers. And if you're an apostle, what do you pray for? If you're responsible for writing the lion's share of the New Testament, what do you pray for? If you're responsible for building the entire Christian presence in Asia Minor and among the Gentile community, what do you pray for? Imagine that responsibility. What do you pray for? Well, Paul tells us what he prays for, and it's quite amazing. We've been talking about going verse by verse through Ephesians, and we're going to do that, a, and we're going to do that in a sense. Uh, we're going to jump to verse 14 in chapter 3, but before we do that, just a real quick note on what verses 1 through 13 are about. You see, Paul, in, in, invariably in, in most of his letters, Paul gives a defense of his own credentials as an apostle. Whether he does it in Galatians, where his credentials are being called into question, or he does it here in Ephesians, where he is just giving his his uh, friends in Ephesus insight into what he goes through and, the, and the, the job that he's been given. So whether he's being defensive or conversational, he always gives his list of credentials. And what he talks about here in Ephesians 3 is, is unique in that sense because he talks about the mystery, which is a word used for the gospel several times by Paul, not just here in Ephesians. And he talks about what this mystery is. And you know what a mystery is? A mystery is something that you never saw coming, Right? Something that was kept hidden from you for you to figure out, but you probably didn't. We love a good mystery, don't we? And one of the things that the people of God leading up to the New Testament, when the people of God in the Old Testament were primarily Jewish in, in nationality, not all of them, but most of them, when the gospel came and they discovered that the gospel wasn't just for the Jews, it was also for the Gentiles. It was for all men. That was the mystery. And he tells us, he tells us about that mystery. And he says, verse 6, This mystery is that the Gentiles are now fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus throughout the gospel. That's an amazing statement. Because what it tells us is, is the... the the mystery of the gospel is that God wasn't working through history just to save his chosen people, but to save all people. To save all people. And I want to talk just briefly about the, the power of the cross and how we kind of downgrade it occasionally. You see, uh, one common misunderstanding is uh, especially among people in the church of Christ, is that what Christ was doing on the cross was he was making men savable. Have, have you ever heard it, it, it phrased that way? I've heard it phrased that way, usually by people who are disagreeing with that belief. That what Christ was doing on the cross is he was making men savable so that men could come to be saved. But that's not what was happening. That's not what was happening. You see, what Christ was doing on the cross is he was paying for the sins of all mankind. Not just the ones who wanted to be saved. Not just the ones who could be saved, but everyone's sins. Did you know that the sins of Adolf Hitler were paid for on the cross of Jesus Christ? Did you know that? Now, before you accuse me of universalism, the idea that everyone is now saved and you don't have to commit to anything, just hold on for a second. Just because a price has been paid, something has been purchased for you, doesn't mean it's yours. Let me give you an example of that. Let's say I, I, I come up to you at, at, at our job and I say, hey, do you want to go uh, after work tonight? You want to go see a movie? And you go, sure, but I've got to go run an errand first. So I'll tell you what, you buy my ticket. Here's the money. You buy my ticket and leave it at the box office for me and I'll meet you in the theater. And I say, okay. So I go and I purchase your ticket. And I leave it there waiting for you. Can you just walk, show up to the movie theater and walk in without getting your ticket first? Will they let you see the movie? No. What do you have to do? You have to claim your ticket. So here's how it works, folks. We have to claim our ticket. Just because your sins are paid for doesn't mean you're not still responsible for them if you haven't claimed the payment. 
But that's huge what Christ did on the cross. And that was a mystery. You see, the, the Jews of the, fir, of the first century really believed that the Messiah was coming just to save them. To save them from the Romans. Because God only cares about, God is tribal. And he's, he only cares about the Jewish people. They couldn't have been more wrong. Christ wasn't working throughout history to save one nationality of humanity. He was working to save all nationalities, all human beings. How much more beautiful is the gospel when that mystery is revealed? And Paul says that it's my job to let the cat out of the bag. It's my job to go to the Gentiles and say, you've been saved too. Your sins have been paid for as well. Rejoice. You know that song we sing? We should, you know, George, we should start every service with that song, Hosanna. You know what Hosanna means? Glory be to God in the highest. That's what, that's what it means. We should start every service with that. Why? Because we praise God not only for who He is, but for what He did. And what did He do? He saved me even though I didn't want to be saved. Even though we didn't have to. Even though I was perfectly comfortable in my own sin and death, deluding myself that I didn't need to be saved, he saved me anyway. He paid for my sin anyway. And all I have to do to gain the benefit of that salvation is surrender to it. That's, a, that's an amazing thing. So Paul lets, it in, lets us in on it that it's my job to let the good news out. Because we love a good mystery, but we love a mystery even more when the result is the happy ending. And what's a more happy ending than that? That all men can be saved? But he keeps going. He says, for this reason, verse 14, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. Now, it's an interesting point about this verse, because you might not have noticed it. But that word... Family, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Did you grasp that? That word Father. Hang on to that for a second. From whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Uh, you might have a footnote next to the word family in your Bible. The interesting, the interesting thing about this word is that it's very close <laughs> to the Greek word for father. And an alternate reading of this instead of family, it probably does mean family unit. Okay? Or, or you know, congregational family. Assembled family. But you could read it and still technically be accurate this way. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every fatherhood in heaven and on earth is named. I find that interesting. Why? Because fathers are fathers because God is our Father. Mothers are mothers because God is our Father. Where's the first place that children meet God? Their parents. Why? Because we have been given the responsibility of parenthood because we have a divine parent. And what he's saying is, is that that has made his expression known in every human society. In every human society. Throughout history. God has made his presence known through parenthood. But he's praising him in this prayer. You can't help but praise. Once you know that, that mystery, you can't help but praise him, right? For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be, look here, strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner be being. You know, the truth is, folks, is that many people in the Church of Christ throughout history, since our inception, um, because of what the denominational world has done with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, uh, we've become afraid of it. <laughs> we've become afraid of it. And we almost treat the Holy Spirit like he's the silent partner of the Trinity, right? And like, well, you know, oh, oh, yeah, the Father. Let's talk about the Father. Oh, yeah, the Son. Let's talk about the Son. Uh, let's talk about the Spirit. Oh, uh, let's not. <laughs> because we're afraid of it. Why? Because mistakes have been made. Let's be honest. Mistakes have been made. But why would you do that? Why would you do that? 
I can tell you this, that I've, met, I've run into many, many members of the Church of Christ throughout the years who are hesitant to say something to this effect or pray something to this effect. God, send me your spirit. Strengthen me with the power of the Holy Spirit. Guide me by your spirit. Guide me by the Holy Spirit. Church, the answer to the errors that have been made is not to cut the Holy Spirit out, it's to use it correctly. Because what have we just been promised here in the prayer that Paul is praying for you and me? Because remember, what has he just told us? He said he's not praying that prayer for, for, for you and me, he's praying for the Ephesians because it's in Ephesians and it's addressed to the Ephesians. No. Because what did he just say previously? That I am responsible for who? The Gentiles. Guess who that is? <laughs> you and me. You and me. You and I are here, are Christians today, because of the work that Paul did to spread the gospel to all nations. And all nations are represented here. So this message, this prayer, is for the Christians who come from all nations, including you and I, who are 2,000 years removed from this prayer. He's praying for you and me. And he says what? I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he, God, may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Church, the truth is, is that we all know that we're not strong enough at times, right? That we have moments of great weakness. Doesn't it seem like every time we have the opportunity to do something right, we mess it up? Doesn't it seem that way sometimes? And maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, I don't do that. I don't mess things up. Well, you just did. You just did. Because the truth is, is that we all have those moments. We fall short. We fail. And when we should be standing, we find ourselves flat on our face. The reason why Christians fail is because they go it alone. Don't go it alone. Imagine standing on the precipice of an open door in an airplane, getting ready to jump out. And you're standing there and you put your goggles on, you put your helmet. Why do they give you a helmet? No, honestly. Oh, I better have that helmet on because if this parachute doesn't open, I'm going to need it. <laughs> goggles I get because you have to see things. But helmet, that's, <laughs> it's kind of like that whole, in case of, in case of uh, the plane's going down, you know, assume the crash position. That's not going to help. Uh, <laughs> the, um, but imagine standing there on the precipice, looking down thousands of feet in the air, putting your goggle on, putting your helmet on, putting your vest on, putting your jumpsuit on, making sure all your, glo your gloves are all right, and then the instructor comes to you and hands you your parachute and goes, here, put this on. He goes, nope, that's all right. I can make it without it. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? I don't need a parachute. Church, don't limit your ability to succeed because you're too prideful to accept help. How many times have you failed because you refused to accept help from someone else? Now, honestly, think about that. How many times have you refused help because you felt you could do it on your own and then you ended up with mud on your face? Whether you refused help from your fellow man or from God himself. No, I can do it myself. God wants me to be my own man. God wants me to be able to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. No, church, that's, a, that's, that's the American talking, not the Christian. That's the American talking, not the Christian. God doesn't want you to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. He wants you to pull yourself up by his bootstraps. Because his bootstraps are the only ones thick enough to get you upright. That's crazy talk. It's as silly as jumping out of an airplane without a parachute because you'll think, I'll figure something out between the plane and the ground. That's silly. Be strengthened by his spirit. Paul has prayed for that, for you. But not only this, verse 17, I pray this so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted, 
Very interesting word. Rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You know what Paul prays for here? He prays for the impossible. You will never fully understand the height, the breadth, the width, and the depth of the love of Christ. It's incomprehensible. It's too big. Understanding that is more difficult than trying to understand exactly how big the universe is. To comprehend it. It's incomprehensible. Or how many stars there really are. To count them and number them. You can't do it. Your brain's not big enough. But he asks for it. Why? Because the benefit, the benefit in struggling to understand it is not found in the comprehension It's found in the attempt. You know, there's another impossible command in Scripture that Jesus himself gives. When he's asked what the greatest command is, you remember his answer? He quotes Deuteronomy 6. He says, The greatest command is, Love the Lord your God. With what? All your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. I heard a sermon once. It was the worst ser- one of the worst sermons I've ever heard in my life. You ever heard a really bad sermon before? Don't say it. <laughs> but you ever heard a really bad sermon before? This is one of the worst sermons I've ever heard. Okay, um, I, I saw I, I saw it coming out of your mouth, Dan. <laughs> and it was on that verse, and it said the ser- the sermon was saying this. It's like, look, when Jesus says, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength," He's saying some of us are heart people, some of us are body people. Some of us are soul people. That's not what he's saying, folks. He's not saying to pick which one you can do on that list. He's saying for you to love God fully with all five things. And guess what? How many of you in this room have ever fully kept that command? Not me. There have been days where I have loved God with my heart, but not with my body. There have been days where I loved God with my body, but not with my soul. There have been days where I loved God with my mind, not with my heart. I have, every time I have attempted to fulfill that command, I've fallen short. How about you? But the benefit of that command is not in in the success of its keeping. It's in the attempt of its keeping because my life, if I'm attempting to do that every day, my life's just going to keep getting better and better and better. And the more often I sit and think about, when was the last time you sat in a quiet room and you sat there without the TV on, without having a conversation or talking on the phone or texting, you just sat there and you just honestly think, I'm going to sit here for 10 minutes and I'm going to think about how much Christ loves me and how big that love really is. You'll never wrap your your head around it, but you'll get something out of it. Because the goal here is not to comprehend it, but to see how much he loves me so that I can start viewing myself the way that he sees me. So that I can start seeing myself as valuable as he sees me, as he considers me to be. That's the point of trying to attempt impossible commands. But he keeps going. This amazing thing you know what, I, it's, it's on ESV on, uh, on the, uh, the board, but I, I, I love the NIV reading of this. So I'm going to read it from the NIV. I, you know what, I'm not even going to read it. I can quote it to you. 20 and 21. Here's how he ends his prayer. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, to him be glory, And in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Do you know what that's him doing? That's him saying in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't that a better way to do it? 
Don't we just kind of throw that in on the end of our prayer sometimes, say in Jesus' name, amen, just to get it over with? But it's a little empty. It's a little quick. It's a little trite. You know, the truth is when Bill was up here and he was reading this passage before his prayer, he didn't have to pray. <laughs> he just read a prayer. What if we ended our prayers that way, with that much heart, with that much sincerity, when we pray to God for strength, to, for comfort, for healing, for success? When we pray to him asking of the deepest desires of our hearts, what if instead of saying at the end, in Jesus' name, amen, we said, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, to him be the glory and in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, and then say, amen. That's how you pray, right? But what's amazing about this, and we'll close with this, what's amazing about this is, that's what he says. And it's here in the ESV too. Now to him who was able to do far more abundantly okay, than all we ask or think, according to his pow- the power that is at work within us. Notice he says, than all we ask or what? Think. I told you we were going to bring it up. We're not going to get too political here. Okay? Because I don't want to get yelled at. But we got to talk about this. Because your, your world's about to change. Let's just be honest with that. No matter who you're voting for, no matter who you're hoping for, your world is about to change. And the truth is, folks, is that I'll be honest with you. Um, In 33 years of life, I have seen a few presidential elections. And for my money, this is probably the hardest one to feel good about. We're not going to endorse anybody, but I want to tell you this. I watched that second debate and I just stared dumbfounded at the screen the whole time. I never seen anything like that in my life. I thought they were going to hit each other with a chair. Where's Jerry Springer? He should be moderating this. <laughs> this is, it, it's insane. Because even when you get into conversations with people here, and here, this is the world we're in, where somebody says, who are you voting for? And you say, I'm voting for Hillary. And then they go, but I really kind of hope she doesn't win. And then you say, well, who are you voting for? I'm voting for Trump. But I kind of hope he doesn't win. Because the truth is, is that, folks, it doesn't look like there are any right answers anymore, does it? That we're, gonna, we're having to pick between the lesser of two evils? That is not a position we ever wanted to be in. There are times when presidential elections are going to go, I'm going to vote for that guy. I'm really voting for that guy, right? But now we're just saying so many stupid things, and we're believing so many horrible things, and, we're, and, and so much evil is on the line from so many different <laughs> varieties of evil. Here's a, here, I'm going to share this with you. Maybe this is a little, this is a little beyond my pay grade, but I'm going to give this to you. And you can throw it back if you want. But, but I heard a guy say, I, I'm not kidding, in a Facebook post say, two comments that said this. I think it's funny when people say, I'm going to vote for, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to vote, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to vote for the uh, uh, sexual predator because I don't want people to take away my guns. You know what the response was to that? I think it's funny when people say that I'm going to vote for the sexual predator because I want to be able to have an abortion. That's where we're at. And it's hard to look at that scenario and say, what do we do? I know what to do. You can't. Something bad's coming. And we can all see it coming. No matter who you want to win, we can all see it coming. So what do we do? We pray. What do you do when you can't do anything else? You pray. Here's what we say all the time. Someone comes up to you, you find out that somebody is struggling with something. Some physical problem, some mental problem, some, some, some emotional problem, some financial problem. Fill in the blank. And they come and you, you feel helpless to help them. And they, they, you come to them and you say, is there anything I can do to take away your pain, to help you? What, what do you need? Tell me what you need and I'll try to give it to you. And they kind of get this look on their face and they say, just pray for me. Just pray for me because that's all you can do. Church, do we mean that? As if prayer is some some last ditch effort when we can't do anything else? That's part of it. But prayer is powerful. Prayer is powerful. 
We don't know what to do all the time. We don't know what to think. We don't know how to fix it, whether we're talking about our country or our jobs or our family or our mental health or our physical health or our spiritual health. All of us have some problem in our lives that we don't know how to fix, and that is crazy because we're wearing a parachute. We are plummeting towards the ground. We are seeing it get closer, not farther away, and we're scrambling to think, how do I get myself out of this mess? Never thinking about the fact that we're currently wearing a parachute. Well, I can't do that. (laughs) Church. Now to him who is able to what? Not attempt, not try, but what? Do now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. If he can speak the universe into existence, do you think he can help you with your tiny little human problem? If he can fix the divide between God and man, can he he fix the divide in this country? No problem is too big. All problems are minuscule next to what he did for you and me on that cross. Cakewalk. Easy peasy. So why not ask him to do it? I want to think that all of you have been praying about your vote. I want to believe that, but I know it's not true. Because we like to divorce, you know, what we think about God and what we think about our country, but can't do that. That's how we got here. Amen? Can't do that. You have a couple days left. I'd be praying about it if I were you. You have a problem in your life that you don't know how to fix that maybe no one else has. I'd be praying about it if I were you. I'd be praying about it constantly. What did Jesus do every time he faced a trial? First, not last, first, he prayed. Why? Because he knows who he's talking to. A being that can do anything in my life and in the lives of others and in my nation and in my family. Will you pray with me? Mighty God, we are here before you unable to fix certain things. We've tried and we've failed. Father, we've looked at our country and we've tried to fix it and we've fallen short. We've looked at our marriages and we've tried to fix it and we've fallen short. We've looked at our families, our finances, our jobs, our relationships, our heads, in our hearts and we've tried to fix it and we've fallen short because Father for some reason we don't treat you like the first option we treat you like the last instead of pulling the cord and letting the parachute take over we've tried to fly and we can't fly Father there are men and women here this morning who are falling We're seeing the ground approach. Father, remind us that we have that parachute. Remind us that we're not in this alone. And that we have anything to be afraid of. Because you are our God and we are your people. And you have made us the promise that you will strengthen us with your spirit. And Father, I ask for that this morning. Give us your spirit. Give us your strength. Be with our country. Be with our leaders. Be with our voters. Help us to vote our faith and not our party. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. 
To him be glory. And in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. Are you falling? Do you see the ground coming? Pull the chute and come while we stand and sing.